Welcome everybody to our Let's Do Better Racial Equity Conversation Series. Every Voice Makes an Impact is our final panel tonight, our final panel discussion. Just a couple of reminders to try and keep yourself muted as we can, so we can focus on the panelists. Uh, choose speaker view if you would like to just see only the panelists. And you can use the chat for any communication whatsoever, any, any questions, any comments, any links that you'd like to share or anything like that. And we hope that this series is helping us all transform some of our ideas and intentions. And tonight, what we're gonna be talking mainly about is generational perspectives with a concentration on the danger of staying silent. So if you've missed any of these to date, you can review them or see them for the first time at our diversity page, mvyradio.org slash diversity. These are all being recorded and they're posted there. And on that page is also our diversity statement, our MVY radio, which we are a nonprofit listener supported radio station. We have a diversity statement there that you can read and a reference library that just grows every day. We wanna thank the panelists and you for suggesting links that are so very important for all of us to uh, check in on and read and, and educate ourselves. So we, we know this is gonna be difficult in an hour to cover everything that we know we wanna cover and we need to cover, but we hope that, again, if you, that this is not necessarily the end, we will have access to getting questions answered for you and we can continue to connect you with resources and information. And who knows, maybe we'll, we'll revive this series a little bit later on to give some more information. But things we hope have resonated and stuck with you so far through these panels is to expect, acknowledge, and accept that there will be discomfort and proceed with good intent. Education is critical and ongoing. White fragility is not helpful. And silence is not an option. And so we're going to learn how to let our voices be heard once again tonight. I'd like to take a moment and introduce our panel once again. I'm sure by this point, you know them very, very well, but if you're tuning in for the first time, Clennon L. King comes from Albany, Georgia. If you wanna give a wave, Clennon. He spent many years in Boston as a journalist, winning many awards, including Emmys and uh, National Academy of Television Arts and Sciences Awards and, and Edward R. Murrow and National Association of Black Journalists News Award. The work he does is, is so, immersive and, and he shines a light on lesser known stories that we should all know. And in that case in point, this Sunday, we're gonna do a, uh, a segment on, my, on the Vineyard Current with his, the name of his film, uh, the film company, which is St. Augustine Monica Films. So okay. check him out. Oh, go ahead, Clennon. Were you gonna say something? That wasn't okay. me. Oh, okay. <laughs> That was me. <laughs> oh, okay, Walter. Um, so Clennon's family it was, is a, was a very prominent family in the civil rights movement in Albany, Georgia. His father was Martin Luther King Jr.'s lawyer in the 61-62 Albany movement, the movement in Albany. And he, there's so much history with him. And I urge you to go to our, our diversity page to read more. Sandy Pimentel is the co-founder of the Martha's Vineyard Diversity Coalition. She graduated from UMass Boston with a degree in management of human services and has spent her whole life locally and on a national level, helping to improve the quality of life for all of us, especially children and teens as an educator and, and someone who has raised educators. She has an, she's the author of Blind Acceptance, which is a, another book that, I, you know, we have links to all of these, to the authors on our panel on our diversity page too, where you can go and read about these and get the books. Somebody had asked about that, so we made that happen. Pete Ambrositis, I didn't call you Peter, Pete, uh, you're, in, you're in good standing today. He's a senior client partner for Corn Ferry and it brings 30 years of business and consulting experience, specializing in the development of and importance of diversity strategies. He's been mined for information and in interviews with the Wall Street Journal, Training and Development Magazine, and in the, the book Motivation by Paul Levesque. Uh, the, if you're a wrestling fan, he's more famously known as Triple H. And his heart's just rooted in, in being an example of how to move through the world and guide others to reach for their best selves. Tiffany Adams, our 25-year-old spark plug. She's an old soul full of radiance and charged with action. She is a youth activist 
who teaches anti-racist workshops. She's active on all fronts and ready to engage at a moment's notice, no matter where she is, to help create opportunities for us to make life equitable for all of us, um, to draw attention to things that we don't, that we, that we do, that we may not know that we do to, that perpetuate systemic racism and reveal what we can do instead to be part of this new wave, this wave that's finally gonna wash away all of this racist living and focus on uh, the differences of race. She does her work with nonprofit Calling All Crows. She's also the co-founder of the Glitty Gang Collective, LLC, newly formed and elevating black communities through faith, activism, entertainment, and service. So Tiffany, thank you for being here. Michael McAuliffe, he's been practicing law for 30 years and, some of the highlights, again, you know, there's there these lists are long with the the credit the cred that these these panelists bring. He was the he served as the state attorney in the in and for the 15th Judicial Court, Palm Beach County, as state attorney. He led efforts to adopt and implement ethics reforms in the county, resulting in a series of definitive grand jury reports recommending the establishment of an independent inspector general and ethics commission, and perhaps more famously because he turned some of his early experiences into his book, No Truth Left to Tell, which is historical fiction, but it's based on truth. When he was a civil, a federal civil rights prosecutor in the criminal section of the Civil Rights Division at the Department of Justice in Washington, DC, he tried successfully the grand dragon of the Louisiana Ku Klux Klan and 13 of his associates for hate crimes. So. Thank you for being here, Michael. And Dr. Walter Collier, a founder and trustee emeritus of the Martha's Vineyard Diversity Coalition and organized an organization dedicated to eradicating racism. That's what the Martha's Vineyard Diversity Coalition is doing. He's been a consultant for the US Department of Health and Human Services, National Science Foundation, US Department of Defense. He's written several books and articles in his most recent book called Why Racism Persists and Uncomfortable Truth. He has been speaking on a wide range of topics, also in educating us. And thank you for being here. I wanna thank him for inspiring these panel discussions and helping us get our footing out there in the world with these panels. So what we would like to start with today is you, Dr. Collier, talking about our generational perspectives and the danger of staying silent. Okay, uh, good evening. Uh, let me begin by saying something that may be obvious to some and maybe not to others, and that racism is not innate. It is a learned behavior. It is a learned attitude. Uh, the recalcitrance or stubbornness of racism might give you uh, the idea that it is innate and that it can be found in, in DNA somewhere, but that's not true. And the, the, the conditioning, the teaching uh, actually takes place in the home, at the kitchen table. Uh, it takes place uh, while children observe how their parents interact with people who do not look like them, uh, either in the home or in a store or just out in the streets. And so it's a learning process. It's a process that results in a perspective being built or established. And one of our main or umbrella uh, topic for tonight uh, is generational perspective. Being that we are not only becoming more and more multiracial, we are a multi-generational society. And the cross currents of youthful perspectives versus older people's perspectives is something that is gonna greatly impact the progress we make or do not make with regard to eradicating racism. So I want to start uh, at that point, uh, taking a look at the, the perspectives and views of the younger generation. And here I'm talking about teenagers and at least the lower half of millennials. And their outlook on racism seems to be quite different from that of their parents and their grandparents. Uh, probably as a result of their interacting more with people of color than their parents or grandparents ever did or ever wanted to do. And as a result, they see things differently. There have been a number of studies, one in particular coming out of the University of Chicago, out of an institute called Gen Forward. Uh, they have found that younger whites are more attuned and sensitive to 
things such as police brutality of people of color, uh, health care disparity, uh, and discrimination within the workplace. Uh, not only are they intellectually more aware of it, but they have begun to act upon it. Uh, we see evidence of that in terms of their willingness to, to join in in street demonstrations and to do other things, uh, protesting the, the disadvantages that are fostered upon people of color. Uh, they are also more likely uh, to invest, let's say, their personal lives, putting their lives on the line. And this is something that's not particularly characteristic of their parents or of their grandparents, certainly. But the picture is not all rosy on the youthful side. Uh, there are young people who, uh, let's say, have graduated from uh, their racist teaching uh, and who have adopted the lifestyles of being anti-Black or anti-Hispanic uh, uh, people. Uh, we, we see this uh, in local areas uh, where white youth uh, uh, terrorize uh, individuals in uh, Black neighborhoods. Uh, they terrorize or bully uh, people of color in the schools. Uh, we have an example right here on Martha's Vineyard uh, where the white students, some of the white students uh, high school are openly anti-Black, anti-immigrant uh, to the point where they bully and they threaten. And, uh, you know, these, these issues are not, you know, uh, unique here, but they're all over the country. So that is to say, while generally speaking, white are awoke, so to speak, uh, there is still pockets of them that have adopted uh, the, the racist perspective and they carry that out. Some of us might remember there were stories in the paper about a white fraternity uh, that, that rejoice in disparaging blacks and, and, and aping what they think blacks are or what they look like. And so those incidences are, are, have not decreased, they have not disappeared. But I bring this up to just let you know that the picture is a mixed picture. Uh, if you want to take a look at the, 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 uh, the attitudes and perspectives of you, you'll find, wow, change is being made, uh, some change is not being made. Some regression is actually taking place. Uh, the older people, and I'm one of the older people, at least age-wise, uh, tend not to be so readily disposed to getting rid of their old habits, their old ways of looking at things. I, but um, it's so embedded in there uh, because of, of years of conditioning, not only in terms of their family situations, but largely because they remain fairly segregated. You know, when you segregate yourself from people who don't look like you, you tend to view those people based on media has to say uh, what political people are saying that these other people are alike, and you really don't give yourself a chance to think on your own, so to speak. And so there is, is uh, a, a greater move uh, in the part of anti-racist and anti-discriminatory uh, organizations on the youth, because we feel that if we can do that, then we have a better chance of impacting a generation and hopefully future generations. Um, another area pushes the young people from the older people and is the, the, uh, the problem of being silent, of being complicit and being complicit and kind of standing on the side doing anything. Uh, white youth, for example, as we've seen since the murder of George Floyd, uh, have stepped out, you know, I mean, with, without apology, uh, without hesitation. Uh, so that they're being more likely not to be silent. And as uh, people who have worked in the educational field have found out that many white youth are, they're sick of this. They want something different. They, they, they want to be able to, to 
to really live in a society that is at least more uh, uh, giving of advantages across color, across uh, ethnic uh, categories than their parents have done. And so the, the, the youth are actually our future. Uh, they are the hope. And this, of course, is not to say that, you know, you can't uh, teach an old dog tricks and let's forget about the older people. I'm not saying that at all, but I'm saying uh, an effort, an intensified effort needs to be put uh, in, the, in the youthful category uh, so that we at, at some point can look back at this problem and realize that we have made uh, some progress. Another problem with remaining silent, and there are many dangers and we don't have time to go into all of them, is that when we remain silent, uh, we should think in terms of what happened in Germany during the war. The Germans remained silent and we know, all of us should know, what the outcome was. And we cannot conclude or even assume that all of the Germans wanted the Jews to be killed and persecuted, et cetera, et cetera. That is not true at all, but they remain silent. There are a lot of people in this country who are white, who are good people, who remain silent. And what happens to that, you open the door for a despot or some uh, 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 mad person, quote unquote, to enter into a leadership position and lead all of us down a very, very dark path. Uh, we saw that, an example of it, and I don't mean to get really political, but the January 6th, February, uh, January 6th uh, uh, attack on the Capitol uh, is, is a, a prime, prime example of how people can be so easily led into violence. And it wasn't, you know, a case of, of violence of, of blacks on whites or whites on blacks. It was white on white police officers and other people because a lot of people remain silent and they hear somebody say something that tinkles their ear and they follow them. And the thing that tinkles a lot of white ears is this, this need to be separate, this need to, to, to foster this, this myth of racial superiority uh, and the fear, the fear mongering that goes on that if whites don't do the, the separating and the jailing and the killing, et cetera, et cetera, that they're going to lose power. They're going to be thrown out of the country. They're going to be sent back to Europe. God knows what kind of thoughts might go through the minds of people. But that stems from remaining silent. We have to speak out and speak up. You know, like John Lewis said, God rest his soul. You know, when you see something that's not right, that's wrong, Say something. Don't yeah. let fear keep you from speaking up. You know, let us learn from the younger generation that is speaking up more. And so um, I think I probably should stop there because we only have the 60 minutes. Yeah. And we, we really do need a week and a half to talk about all the things. We, we really want. do. We really yes. do, Dr. Collier. It's, it, it, this is, um, it's, that is our, our, our obstacle is to try and and to get everything in there and thank you so much for that because it's true our silence is not acceptable anymore and from our generations we all see things through different experiences which you just touched upon so eloquently and so i have to go right to the opposite end of the generation panel here with you tiffany and um and have you kind of pick up the ball now and and tell us through this younger generation, you're the one who's leading us now. How can we, how can you lead us, Tiffany, and from your perspective into all of the changes that we need to make happen? <laughs> how do we let our silent voices get out there the right way? I knew you were gonna do that, Laurel. <laughs> I mean, I thought, I'm next. Um, I think. Uh, there's so much. I'm still processing everything that Dr. Walter just said because it was so much. And I hope you guys really um, took all of that in because you said it was some good stuff. But I think how, uh, hold on. I think 
what people can do to get active, like in our generation of what we want, is for people to not continue to be silent, right? It's to actually dismantle stress. I think, and I think I'm a huge person of continuously saying policies, legislation, policies, legislation, because it's not just you showing up at a protest and utilizing performative allyship. Like that's a, exactly what we've seen from a lot of like white people. And what do you mean by that, Tiffany? Now, can you can you explain what performative? Just explain what that is for people who might not know. Yeah. It's basically you going to a protest and you go into these things for a photo op. So it's the people who literally go and they're like, oh, I have my fist in the air. And now I have this thing that I can put on Facebook and social media to make it seem like I did something big. I did this big deal. When in reality, what petitions have you signed? What structures have you tried to dismantle? Have you been committed to personal growth? It's not just showing up to a protest. It's the work that you do behind the scenes that also matters. And I think that this new generation, like something that I get worried about is this, like this performative allyship because I see it a lot and I teach anti-racist trainings and I see it a lot. And so I think, yeah, my the generation that's younger than me, because I'm actually, I don't think I'm in that generation, but <laughs> that generation is doing so many great things and so is my generation. But I think that it goes beyond just showing up. It goes beyond just doing that. And I think structures, dismantling structures is like key and also not utilizing like cultural appropriation. Ugh, I'm touching something. I shouldn't go there yet, but no, also please, not please go there. Please go there because we do need this. <laughs> Tiffany, really, this is exactly why we're here is we need to know what is not working and what is, is actually maybe even hurting or harming. So do not hold back. This is not yeah. why I asked you to be on the panel. <laughs> <laughs> go for it. Yeah, I just think overall, like we, like what we're seeing right now in this country is a lot of performative allyship. It's a lot of like, people not taking the extra mile and understanding that it is not a sprint. Like everyone, everyone, it is not a sprint. Like the fight to equity is not a sprint. It is a marathon. And I think so many people go into this thinking, oh, I'm gonna go to these protests and I'm gonna go do this like for six months and then it's over. No, like black people have to live with this every single day of their lives. So white people, you don't get to allow it to just be a sprint and then burn out because you also didn't take care of you, right? And so I just think that like within my generation, like a lot of what I see is like people performing and acting like they actually care. But you can also tell when someone cares with how much they do, not just at one protest, but have you come to the one six months later? What are you going to do on March 6th when everyone is gearing up for the, um, the court case for George Floyd? Or did we forget about him? Yeah, that's thank you, Tiffany. Thank you very much. These well, are the things. Yes, yes, Walter. I just want to add one little quick thing. Uh, I, of course, agree with everything that Tiffany just said, but uh, what's missing is education. Uh, one of the things that our school systems fail to provide the students with anymore is civics and how government is structured and how it works. And so we have found through research that a lot of young people just don't know how to go behind the scenes to contact their legislative representatives, how to uh, impact uh, sessions that are discussing something at a town hall. One of the things that, that the MVDC, the multicultural, uh, multicultural, the Martha's Vineyard Diversity Coalition uh, was going to do this year before COVID was to institute an education program that taught elementary, elementary students how to dissect a particular piece of legislation, how to go to the halls of decision-making and lobby for the legislation to be more beneficial uh, to the people that it was targeted to. So what I'm saying by saying this is that some of those white kids who just show up and perform or just want to be seen probably do not know how to do work behind the scenes and they need to be educated in that area. Which, which is exactly, that's a lot of commentary in, about 
the education and how important that is and in getting into those educational institutes, teachers wanting to, you know, get into the classrooms and start younger and younger and younger. And actually we have just added a, uh, a link thanks to, uh, you know, continuing to get those links on our diversity page of a whole list of children's books mm -hmm. that are out there for parents to do at home education as well. So I thank you for bringing that up. And this actually really segues very nicely into something that came in an email to me through John, who said he wants to make it easy for new leaders to enter and rise up in elected seats. And he wanted to get some feedback from the panelists on whether or not you endorse the following. So I'm going to just say them and, and we'll go to Michael first on this. Um, and and <laughs> since you were elected to do this uh, as our lawyer, um, thank you, Tiffany. Automatic registration, rank choice voting, vote by mail, and term limits. Now, they're all very different categories, but maybe we can take those apart and comment on them and define them a little bit for people who might not know what they are. But in the in the um, in the spirit of us trying to get out there and and not stay silent and be constructive and, and not be performative but to be uh, effective. So, away, Michael, you 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 help us through through answering that and starting that conversation. Well, I, I would say from a personal perspective, anything that broadens the opportunity to exercise your right to vote uh, has my support personally and I, I think has self-evident merit to it. Um, I think claims of widespread voting fraud in America are grossly overblown and used for uh, other people's ends. And um, so any healthy discussion um, needs to recognize that, number one, the premise is almost always false. It's not that uh, voting irregularities don't exist. They've always existed. They always will exist to some degree but to use it as an excuse or as a, as a barrier to broadening the base of people to vote uh, is just wrong. So, uh, so automatic registration, I, I, you know, that can mean different things in different jurisdictions, but if that means that when you get a license or that when you uh, make contacts with your, uh, when you uh, buy a home or, you, you know, if you become a resident in a jurisdiction, and there is automatic or presumptive voter registration uh, that seems to me to be to be meritorious. Um, uh, rank order, e either uh, preferential or proportional, or rank order voting, two slightly different things, um, is uh, you know that's a big separate discussion to have, and and I think it 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 has um, it's worthy of of discussion uh, and whether we can use it beyond. Uh, the selected municipal and local elections that employ it now. I think Maine may use proportional uh, or rank order, I'm sorry, rank order uh, for it. So I, I don't have the expertise and we probably don't have the time to, to give it, to do it justice. I think mail ballots, uh, I just filled out a mail ballot today. It's sitting on, uh, on another uh, table in my home to send in for municipal elections. And I happen to be a, 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 a a proponent of uh, mail ballots. Uh, I used to bring my children to vote in person, but I think we're, uh, you know, given current circumstances and for other reasons, uh, we want to make uh, voting more accessible to people who may not uh, uh, be able to physically or otherwise make a pilgrimage to the to the precinct. Um, and then for term limits, uh, you know, term limits do. Um, promote turnover. But again, I think that's a, a bigger topic that deserves more discussion and scrutiny. Um, uh, it's not a, I don't, I don't myself don't think it's an, an easy answer. I, I have been inclined to support term limits, even though I held office in an office that didn't, didn't have any. Um, so, so that's my semi-lawyerly approach to uh, at least two of the four issues. Tiffany, see, you, you, if you had, if you asked me to give me, to, to give the, uh, to weigh in on them, you, you got to know what to expect when you ask a lawyer uh, to answer a question. <laughs> Thank you so much, Michael. Clinton, Clinton, would you like to um, engage on these, um, on um, your feedback? Um, I don't know anything about, you know, politics beyond. I mean, certainly Georgia has just flipped 
from going from red to uh, to blue. Um, and so, you know, I watched my father run for office or be drafted to run for office. Um, and of course, you know, voter suppression is something that is deep and abiding in this part of the world. Uh, but we, we've come out in a much more powerful way um, because of the mobilization of what we faced over the last few years. And so, um, I mean, if you had asked me a year ago, did I think that this state, the largest state east of the Mississippi, would flip from red to blue? The answer is no. I, I wasn't a believer in that way. I made sure that I produced a lot of videos that were about voting rights and against voter suppression. But, you know, I think that all of these things, you know, uh, come together. I'm talking about campaigns against voter suppression. I'm talking about running for office. I'm talking about making sure people cast their vote. Um, because, you know, as you kind of, you know, I know it's the subtext of really this particular uh, discussion. Uh, it's about folks sitting on the sideline. There's a guy who I read about I've never heard of before, um, but it kind of mirrors and and speaks to what I think the focus of this particular program is. The guy's name was Edmund Burke. I don't know who he was, but he had a saying, something to the effect, the only thing necessary for triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. Mm. The only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. Just sit on your hands, folks. And, you know, it's not the ones with the hangsman's noose or, you know, the exterminators. Those aren't the ones. It's the ones who are standing on the sidelines. And so oftentimes we're all guilty of that. And we've got to be ever vigilant not to be guilty of that. So I'd say that at this point. Yeah, now is the time not to be silent. This is the time. And that's what we hope these panels will help us do is to take our, um, uh, many of us, our our stagnation, our inability to you know to know which direction to head in and how to do that and how to navigate our voices out there into the world properly, that this is going to, at the end of this hour, we're going to walk away and we're going to be able to know what to do and what to say. And one of those things is not be silent. So how can we use our voices constructively out there in the world to get rid of the silence and, um, and affect the changes in government, as well as locally, uh, stands we can take, petitions we can sign. Tiffany, you were talking about petitions and things like that. Um, Sandy and Pete, we haven't heard from you yet on this. So Sandy, I wanna get you to talk about um, some things that you maybe have done yourself that we could take as examples of things that can affect real change. Um, and you, you're muted. So sorry. Um, I think, thank you for that, Laurel. Um, I think that there are two tracks to action. And I think that a lot of people who are listening to this, this panel, they really want to know what to do. And many, of, and I think the issue of silence is a big one because I think many of us who are older in white, getting to the generational, I have been conditioned to be more fragile and want things to be nice. And, and we're not used to, to going head on into things. So that makes it more difficult. But I do think there are things that we can do and that we are doing that are making a difference in our own communities. Um, I think the first thing is to build trust with people who don't look like me and to, to make sure that we make every effort to make to develop relationships of trust and that we look inward to ourselves and understand ourselves so that we can move forward in an effective way. That's one thing as individuals. And then what Walter and I have been engaged in is the Martha's Vineyard Diversity Coalition. And we're looking primarily at institutions because many of us have been working, as you mentioned earlier, for many years. And I think we've made a difference in, in terms of some of us within ourselves and, and with other individuals, but institutions remain the same. 
So if we're going to have action, it really needs to be looking at institutions and figuring out how we can help them to be more uh, aware and, more, and, and to, to move into a culture of inclusion. Um, and we are actually working on four different tracks. We're looking at health disparities and we're working with COVID right now, really trying to make sure that, um, that there's equity in the way that the, the, the vaccine is delivered. There are some of us are volunteering you know, to, to do that. And that's been working, I think, pretty well. We have an education committee. We're looking at curriculum. We have a library project that is bringing books to every library across the island. That's an action, a concrete action. Um, we're looking at criminal justice. We've been uh, vetting and, and researching um, uh, effective bias training, anti-bias training for the police. And we've, met, we've secured funding for six police departments across the island. There's a lot going on. And I think, you know, we, we need to look within ourselves and look to our communities. And there are a lot of people who want to make a difference. And I think silence is deadly as in, in terms, in, and I think that, that uh, Walter referred to, to Germany. I think it's a, it's a reasonable analogy. So, I mean, I, I, and anything that I've done in, in the last 50 years, it's all based on relationships of trust. And if you're gonna work in institutions, there need to be people who wanna make a difference, who trust each other. And we need to do this together. So that's, thank you, I don't Sandy. know if that helps, but. Yes, thank you, Sandy. And you know, I, I think that we can all look to our, our communities for organizations that are organizing to do things and participate in these, these ways that you're talking about uh, of, of getting, your feet on the pavement out there doing what we need to do and action and acting in any way we can act. You know, big, uh, did Glennon, did you have something? No, no. Okay. I, um, so uh, this question actually, cause this, this rolls very nicely into the fact that, you know, a lot of what speaks out there in the world is big business. And uh, Anne wants to hear from you, Pete, which is perfect because we haven't heard from you yet. And I wanted to get you on the hot seat. So um, she wants to hear you talk about corporate fragility. And do you think that PricewaterhouseCoopers CEO is, is standing out right now? Absolutely. And it's, it goes beyond that, <clears throat> honestly, that, Laurel. The, the truth is, is that over the past 15 years that I've been specifically focusing in on diversity and inclusion work in the corporate environment, one of the big shifts that's happened is that there are more board um, boards that are requiring more representation from uh, top leaders within their organizations and top leaders are being forced to look at their talent pipeline up and down the organization because you can throw out numbers that say, well, you know, we have the same percentage of um, you name the group, in this case, black talent that represents the population. But when you get nearer and nearer to the top of the organization, it becomes a lot like me, right? It tends to be male dominated, white, and there isn't the representation that is required. And these boards are really pushing senior leaders to become more diverse at the top of the house, including at the board level. So that work is definitely taking place. I, I saw the same um, headline this morning and, and we're seeing more and more of this where people are, picking and choosing how they can show much more today since the George Floyd murder, even in the past year, never mind over the past 10 or 15. So part of what we do um, in the work that I, when I'm working with corporate clients is we're not only just looking at representation though, because when you look at all of the other uh, structural impacts that there are out there on people of difference, uh, whether it's pay equity, whether it's uh, the, the ability for client organizations to recruit diverse talent and then keep diverse talent. Because it's one thing to say, we're at all the right colleges, we have the right representation farther down in the ranks. And then you look at the data and the data sh shows that that diverse talent is only lasting five years and leaving because the environment at that organization does not let, allow the individuals to bring their own self. 
So we joked earlier, though, Laurel, that we, we could say that it's the, it's the corporations or senior leaders that need to fix this issue. We all have a responsibility to help fix this issue. And we joked at the beginning before we went on the air when you were asking Tiffany about her, her shirt. And, you know, it was an innocent question. And I gave you some positive feedback about that's a really simple way for us to have the intestinal fortitude as people that might be in the majority to start feeling comfortable with asking questions about aspects of diversity that you're, you don't know about or that you're not comfortable asking about. Because until we all learn to understand each other more effectively, it's going to be very difficult for us to collaborate and work towards a common goal, in my opinion, from a personal perspective, because it isn't just all the CEOs or board of directors. It's all of us when we're at work and when we're at home. For people who might not know what Peter was referring to, thank you for that, Peter. I, um, you can see Tiffany's beautiful top, and I had asked her what it was called. And, and Tiffany, what did you say? Dashiki. Yes. A dashiki. <laughs> That's what it's, it's a dashiki, right? Yeah. And so we were talking about that. And, um, and yes, and so those are simple ways, Pete, is what you're saying. Um, an innocent comment like that can go, can make an, um, an impact. So um, when we talk about big business, is, is it, a lot of people talk about we, we vote with our money, you know, we pay. So how can, so how we go out into the world and engage with businesses, how, what are the, what are the best ways to do that? How can we uh, do what you just were talking about, Pete, and be part of this change out there and letting businesses know that we want to see more diversity and that we want things to happen? Well, the, the vote with the pocketbook co comment is, is is more visible today than ever, right? I mean, we, I hear my wife Ruth talk about it all the time that she's not going to buy from company XYZ any longer because she, she her particular cause happens to be about stuff, clothing being imported from outside of North America and those working conditions are unacceptable. We, we The more we're informed, the more we make our uh, to take this as a personal responsibility, the more likely it is that you can support certain businesses or cer certain corporations based on their public stand on issues. And what you saw today with the CEO for PricewaterhouseCoopers was that them taking a stand that they're going to communicate to the outside world what their numbers represent. And then you can decide whether or not those numbers are good or bad, because as we all know, numbers can be manipulated to whatever cause that you're looking for, but you need to be careful about having a full understanding and not just going down uh, you know, a Facebook uh, tunnel of misinformation that could potentially be out there. So more than one source is also a good idea to verify your position. Thanks, Pete. So where we're at right now is we've got 15 minutes left and we really want to get, we want to get our, our boots into action, an action plan. Uh, so we've been talking a lot about silence and we've been talking about changing cultures and business cultures, community culture, uh, cultures in our own households and families and things and, and arming ourselves with ways we can talk about these things and, and proceeding with the, with the acknowledgement and acceptance that discomfort is part of the is part of the game. It's part of the discussion. It's part of the reality and we need to go out there. So what I would love to ask the panelists right now is if you can reflect on what we've talked about so far, because we're all coming from different backgrounds and different experiences and different sectors of the world and, and of you know industry and, and home life where we, if we are gonna, down to the very nucleus of things. What is what are the most important things to your mind's eye and your heart that we need to take away from this for us? And 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 some real things like pick three things that we can do right this moment after we get off the panel that or tomorrow or this week that we can do to affect change. And let's start with you, Clennon. Well, um, you know, I go back to what I had said earlier. Um, I think the basis of all loves is self-love. Um, and while I know that the focus of this uh, diversity conversation has in large part been with sort of a white audience, you know, 
I really want to speak to black parents that for as much as we have high hopes that lots will change during our lifetime, we cannot afford to put at risk our most valuable assets in our children. And they must be aware infinitely that they are black in a white world and they have to navigate accordingly, recognizing that this world is not well and that they need to walk around, as my father always put, with an imaginary mirror in their back pocket to always remind them who they are uh, so that we can live another day. You know, for as much as we have high hopes that everything will be, we'll have this sort of kumbaya, we'll have an enlightenment, all of that, that's all fine and well. But in the meantime, the affirmative action that we have, the affirmative responsibility that we have as a community, as a black community, is to see about our most valuable assets. And a part of that is never giving them the impression that things have changed that much. They haven't. And so let's take care of that first. So self-love first, and then we'll go on to these other, these other concerns. So acknowledge, you. no, Clennon, that's really real. I mean, we have to acknowledge right now that we are still living in a world that is very, very frightening and very, and not set up to make it comfortable for people with black skin. It, it, it is, uh, we have that hope, but the reality is that is the truth. So we as white and black people need to be aware of that so we can move through with that caution that is, you know, that heightened state of, of alertness and awareness. So we can be on the lookout more for opportunities to protect if we're white, and we have black people around us, we can look for ways that we can kind of buffer and protect. Do you think that that's helpful, Clennon? Absolutely, absolutely, that, that, that makes sense. I just, I just don't think that we can afford to forget. You know, again, I, I use the, the, um, the example the last time, it's kind of like a blind man trying to, you know, basically cross one side of the turnpike to the other and say, I'm not blind, I'm not blind. And some tractor trailer rig goes and mows him over or some pickup truck goes and mows him over. You got to remember who you are. You got to remember that you have to navigate the world differently. For that blind man to get on the other side of the turnpike, he's going to have to put his ear to the ground. He's going to have to listen for vibrations. He's going to have to do the, the necessary work to protect himself. And it's no different where it concerns people with this thing called black skin, with this melanin. They've got to protect themselves. So we can get into all of this, and this is all fine and certainly, but I think that there are different audiences here, and I have a responsibility as a Black man to speak to that audience, uh, to speak to those parents, to speak to those kids, not just Black males, but also Black females, when you think about, a, you know, Breonna Taylor or a Sandra Bland. I mean, it is what it is. So I just say that... Um, so that nobody really gets it twisted that this is a larger audience than than what we may think it is. So, Yes, we are each individuals. After we leave here, we're going to have a responsibility to take what we've heard and put it out there into the world and into practice. So um, what you're saying, Clinton, is extremely important that we are uh, we're talking about a lot of proactive things and change and, and putting a lot of good thoughts and intentions out there. But there is a reality that we still have to move through and uh, is it fair to say then, um, let's go to Tiffany, that when we, uh, as, as white people are going through and as black people, no matter who we are, where we come from, that when we have that mirror in our back pocket, Clinton, like you were just talking and we know what color we are and how we proceed, that uh, we move forward knowing that, that our intention is to break down these, system, these systems that have racism in place. But while we're doing that, there is still a need for that, that protection and respect or an acknowledgement that it's, it's still dangerous out there. And we still, so we need to make these changes together as a group, but we need to kind of almost move together with measured steps, taking everything into consideration. Well, I mean, let me just say this one thing, okay. Laurel. I mean, the reality is, I don't think this is such a tall order at the scheme of things. I have faith in white people in as much as, you know, they were the ones who handed us the Bible. Mm -hmm. It tells us the difference between right and wrong. Okay, I mean, you know, we may come from a, a, a different uh, religious tradition in many respects, but people know the difference between right and wrong. This is not rocket science. This is basic. 
This is it. This is, you know, we don't have to have a seminar over this stuff. People know and they're, they're you know, history is full of examples of white people doing the right thing. And then they're full of examples of them doing the wrong thing. And I think I just believe enough in people so that I know that people know the difference. So let's just do the right thing. Yeah. In the meantime, black folk got to remember who they are. In okay. the meantime. Yep, got so. it. Tip, that's, thank you. Tiffany? Yeah, I completely agree with you, Clinton. But you know, there's never, never too much I disagree with you with. Um, I think that... <laughs> The reality of the situation is this, like black people, we have to take care of ourselves. Like, and if you didn't know that, now you do. You have to take care of yourselves. And I think like, you need to learn your own history. Like, don't just listen to what white people tell you about your history, go learn it yourself. White people go learn black history. Like everyone go learn your history. We keep, we said that in every single one of these panels, I won't let this panel end without saying it again. Go learn the true history of black people, right? And it will shock, some of it will shock you, right? Um, black people, you are royal. Like you are kings and queens. And I feel like we're never talked about like that. And I will forever talk to black people like you are kings and queens because that's who you are. You are doctors, you are lawyers, you are activists. You are amazing people. We are, our melanin is always popping. Know that, right? White people, be committed to personal growth. Like do them, go in your mirror and check yourself. See where you are. Look, look at your implicit biases. It's hard. We all have to do it, but really get a good picture of where you are and do something about it. If you're not where you want to be, which no white person should ever say they are, you need to do something about it, right? Go, please don't let this be the only time talk about anti-racism, that you talk about action. Go join an anti-racist um, group in your community that elevates the voices of those at the bottom of the pyramid. So black voices, you need to go learn from black people. That does not mean take all of their time. That does not mean you don't do your own personal growth. That means that you elevate their voices and you listen to their stories because their experiences matter. And black people just take care of yourselves. No one else is gonna take care of us like we do. Take care of you, take care of yourself, care. Like the next month is gonna be tricky for black people. Like we're gonna have to remember Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, George Floyd, and the countless number of people before. Take care of you, cause no one else will. Thank you, Tiffany. Brave, being brave. All of us need to be brave and understand that and not get defensive. Again, white fragility, there's no room for white fragility and there's no room for silence anymore. So we can just um, hear what everybody's saying and move forward. Uh, Michael, would you share some of your kind of wrap up reflective words? Sure. Um, uh, coming from, from a, a position of, a, a, a note of uh, positive uh, growth and and forward looking. Listen, I, I think we um, need to not only change and broaden the color palette up, uh, with which we paint. We have to strengthen the canvas. Uh, and so, you know, there's the, the changing demographics of America. Um, now, all the challenges and all the uh, shortcomings and all the fault lines that we've talked about. Uh, have occurred you know, in this historical uh, spectrum uh, over time. And we've, we've never been in this time before. And that gives me great hope. Uh, for example, this last decade, uh, if the census bears this out, will be the first decade since the census started in the 1790, I think, um, that the white population in America will not grow. And so other demographics are taking a larger place in, um, in that color palette. And so, uh, you, you know, these times are different than any previous time. And that gives me some hope that, um, that we will uh, embrace uh, uh, the diversity and the change in America. And, you know, we see how it, it can be uh, uh, used for violence and for hurting others. But in general, you know, the long 
view of the change, I, I hope is that we not only recognize that we can paint and create art in our lives, in our collective communities uh, with more colors and more vibrant colors and different uh, proportions of colors, but also strengthen the underlying canvas. And, and the one thing that I would say is when the census is finished, uh, um, uh, it can be used to help strengthen and make fair, more fair the, the, the way that we vote for our representatives in a representative democracy. So redistricting to me, if you ask me one issue that could change America over the next 20 years, it's, um, it's, a, it's a better process of allocating districts for representation. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. That was really helpful. Sandy? Um, yes. Thank you, everybody. Um, I think the one thing that hasn't come out, and I think Tiffany uh, spoke very directly and very eloquently, um, is that we need to be willing as white people. When I say we, you know, I'm talking about white people. I don't like to use that because I like to think of us all being we, but, but um, we need to be able to give up something. And that may be the biggest thing that we do is to give up. And that means we, it's a hard thing to do. We have to give up power. We have to give up power. We have to give up jobs. We have to give up all the advantages that we've had for so many years. And that's really hard for a lot of people, but we've got to be willing to do that if, if we're going to make a difference. And um, I think that that really, in many cases, is a major piece of racism that over the years, we haven't been willing to give anything up. So um, I'd like to throw that out. And also, um, uh, what can we do um, that may be really profound? I think the economics came out of it. And you know, those of us who are privileged, who have portfolios, um, you can look at those portfolios and, and, and companies like Ben and Jerry's that have really been responsible, look at those companies and those that haven't and, and gear your portfolio around those companies that are going to be sensitive and that respect, um, uh, you know, uh, inclusion. So those are a couple of things. And I remember uh, many years ago, I that Scarlett Johnson mentioned John Lewis's uh, Voting Rights Act. And I think the other thing that we can do as, as white people is to be aware of these stories. And I had the pleasure of meeting John Lewis and being able to talk to him on a couple of occasions individually. And it was probably the biggest privilege of my life. But one of the things he talked about is having to count jelly beans in order to be able to vote. The number of jelly beans in a jar and not being able to be in a library that he ultimately ended up writing a book and going back to. Having these stories, you know, um, can be very powerful. So those are some of the things that come to mind. Um, Thank you, Sandy. Pete? I'm going to keep it simple because I know we're running out of time. So I think we've been talking about, number one, the importance of education. And it sounds like a broader topic, but I think we all need to be able to, whether you're white or black, learning about other people and learning about how we can have a, a positive impact and help create that collaboration that we talked about and become a change agent. The more we understand about how people are feeling, do they feel like being treated equal is enough? The answer is no, being treated equal is not enough. We need to be change agents at work. If you see something, you need to ask yourself, why is this happening and what can I do about it as an individual, not expecting someone to come in from you know, corporate headquarters to fix the situation. And that goes in social settings as well. Thank, thank, you, thank you so for much. Having me, Laurel. Thank you so much, Pete. And thank you to all the panelists. As, as we knew, we were gonna run out of time um, and there's so much more to say. But I do want to thank, with all my heart, Walter, Peter. <laughs> I did it, Pete. Pete. Uh, I did that on purpose. Uh, Sandy, Tiffany, Michael, and Clennon. 
Thank you so much for being here and giving us so much of your time and your wisdom and your words. Uh, we will we'll continue the conversation in our own homes now. And I want to just, uh, again, reflect on some of the things we hope you take away from this. And the biggest thing is don't stay silent. Educate yourself. I love what Tiffany, what you always say is we've got to be brave on both sides, black and white and any other color and any other uh, culture. We, we just need to be brave humans to be able to go out there, have these conversations, which we will encounter discomfort with, it's going to be okay. Uh, we can be comfortable being uncomfortable and being able to ask if we go in with the right intent. Everyone hears something different, you know, during listening experiences and, and conversations. So if we can try to remember more often than not that the intentions are good with whoever we're speaking with, and that, you know, we think we are hearing what we think we are hearing might not be what we're hearing. So we can proceed with curiosity and, and confidence and kindness and good intent and ask the questions, give people an opportunity to before moving to that next level of emotion to explain themselves so that we can have these productive conversations. And then we can go out into the world and make real changes. Pete just said, be a change maker. Um, there's, we can do it in so many different places. It's needed in so many different places. And self-love, as Clennon said, and personal growth, as Tiffany said, uh, uh, strengthen our canvas, as Michael said, and, and, and Walter and Sandy, uh, with everything they do with the Martha's Vineyard Diversity Coalition, this world is not well, but we all have an opportunity to be a part of bringing a cure, bringing a salve, bringing something that is better than what we brought yesterday. So I wanna thank AHA New Bedford for underwriting this series. These are being, recorded. They're all on our diversity page at mvyradio.org slash diversity. We have our diversity library there. Uh, on behalf of MVY Radio and, and everybody that helped make this happen, we're a nonprofit listener supported radio station. We, we take our voice very seriously in the way we engage with the community. And we hope that these panels have been useful to you. Again, it's nothing, no situation is ever perfect, but we, we've invited you in to these to hear these incredibly powerful voices from lots of different walks of, of life and living out there. And, and we're really hoping that you walk away with something that resonates deeply and has changed you in some way. But embrace the discomfort and be brave. And thank you so much for your time, your attention and for showing up because that's, that's the first step is showing up with a good heart. So thank you once again to everybody on the panel and to you and I, uh, I invite you to continue to email me with questions, laurel at mvyradio.org and visit our diversity page and, and continue to engage with us and tell us what you wanna hear in the future. Thank you so very, very much for being here. Time for all, but before you go, if you've already hopped off, I, I obviously you're not listening to me, but we have one more. We always end with our joyful moment, our black joy and Tiffany, thank you for this. So let's play our video and go off feeling inspired. Joy is more than laugh lines, more than what our faces reveal. Joy is one of our greatest strengths. How we express it, how it moves through our bodies, but it's not always easy. To be black and joyful is to resist to defy limitations. Introducing in support of Black Joy. Stories from Black creators celebrating joy in all its forms. Presented by Curology. That's a good place to start too, for if you wanna go get more information, Curology has some wonderful videos inspiring. So thank you again for your presence and go out and change the world in every way you can. <laughs>